In the early years of this century, the Journal of Foreign Policy um, did a globalization index, tried to rate the most globalized countries in the world. And number one wasn't the usual suspects, Singapore, Switzerland, any of those places you might think. It was Ireland. And Ireland was consistently the most globalized country in the world. So how do you map that? How do you go from the furrows, the lines of the furrows of the cage of fields to the kind of fractal dispersion of a globalized world? That is the challenge of Irish studies and of making Ireland today. We have the pole position to be the site for the study of Ireland. We have the people, we have the resources, we've heard about what's here in the library. I mean, this is the most highly ranked arts and humanities faculty in this island. We have students here, not just from Ireland, not just from the UK. Um, I have an Irish studies seminar where I, have, where I have a student from Iran. I have a student there from, from Germany. I have a student from Singapore. And they're interested in Ireland. Why? Why would a student from Iran be interested in Ireland? The issues that Ireland has faced over the centuries are issues that you can pick up any newspaper and see replicated today. Issues of, of starvation and poverty, issues of violence and communities divided and turning in on themselves, people being forced to flee their country and then not being accepted in other countries. Economic rises and economic collapses are things that we're very familiar with here. Ireland is a kind of laboratory for an advanced modernity. And that's what we can offer. And that's what a 21st century Irish studies has to look like. It has to deal with a globalized Ireland in which the cycles of boom and bust, the emergence of a multicultural society, the new fluid relationship with the diaspora, the dismantling of what seemed like once immovable pillars of culture, all of these things are changing. We're living in a vertiginous moment right now. We're living in a revolution that is every bit as profound as the ones a century ago that were in the process of commemorating. The Irish story, uh, the forces that helped make Ireland, are I think forces that people in other countries would understand. And by helping to explore and understand where we are now and the forces that helped shape us, I think uh, that has a uh, comparable uh, interest and benefit for others. Yesterday, the president, Michael D. Higgins, was in California, in Berkeley, where he launched a Irish studies program. Um, and it's great to see that. There are networks of Irish studies programs all around the world. Most of them fall in the kind of category of area studies. But here in Trinity, we have a kind of critical mass. We're working with 14 disciplines, 53 members. Between us, we've published 51 books, 68 edited collections, 500 book chapters. There is, I think it's probably safe to say, nowhere around the world an Irish studies program with this kind of critical mass. A distinctive aspect of Irish studies in Trinity is that it goes beyond the arts and the humanities into the sciences. So along with those disciplines, we also have, for example, work in uh, the scientific analysis of environmental change. Uh, Dan Bradley's work in genetics has contributed to our understanding of the origins of the Irish as a people and to the vexed debate about the Celtic origins and the Celtic identity of uh, the Irish. So I think Trinity has a unique base, a very strong base in what we might call traditional Irish studies disciplines, but also has this uh, distinctive aspect in bringing in work from the sciences uh, to uh, expand the range of work that we do. There is a very popular visual cliché of the artist as a tortured genius starving in a garret. Now, they may be tortured, there's certainly a lot of genius around, and, and they may be starving, but they certainly don't work uh, within a vacuum. And I can tell you that they work very much uh, with a familiarity of the context in which they're working. Rightly, we have this extraordinary um, reputation for literature, but so much of the literary products are highly visual as well. Just read Sing and you can see the pictures. You know, look at the way dramatists um, project their narratives on the visual framework of the stage. This really debunks the traditional notion of the Irish as not visually literate. And of course, um, the exploration of these artists and cultural practitioners is what we do, is what we do in the disciplines within Trinity, with art history, with Irish studies, with drama and literature. And we don't do it in a vacuum either. We don't starve in our garrets. We work collaboratively in, with other disciplines. You're part of a community of scholars 
that shares your values and you're part of a wider community than within Trinity which says this is important. The Making Ireland theme uh, is beginning to develop a hugely ambitious interdisciplinary inter-institutional project that will simply transform our understanding and engagement with Irish history and culture. Now, the plume of smoke that we see rising from the Four Courts complex uh, remains one of the most iconic images uh, of the Civil War in 1922. And as the Public Records Office burned to the ground, our past literally went up in smoke. But recent scholarship here at Trinity promises redemption. New technologies in digital humanities, which you've heard about, and geographic information systems, we've had our colleague from geography here just talking, allow us to reassemble and reconstruct sources long believed to have been destroyed. The Making Ireland team will lead the way as we recreate a virtual archive, rebuilding the Public Records Office and allowing visitors to discover at last, not only what has been lost, but much more importantly, what has survived. I can't wait to get started. Thank you. <laughs>